Okay, so yesterday we were talking about gray coding. Um, gray coding exists where only a single bit changes between individual <laughs> individual codes. Um, and where that really came from, or why we care at all about it right now, is we're going to use it for what we call K-maps, or minimization by mapping. Um, minimization by mapping is just another way to look at the truth table. So here's an example truth table we had set up from before, um, some ones in it. And it also shows you where the min terms are. So with a K-map, how it's set up is we split the variables, A, B, and C. So these are the input variables, A, B, C. Um, along the top and down the side. A, B, and it's arranged into this group here. It's a group of two on the top and one down. You can also have two across and two down. Um, and between each adjacent square, only a single bit changes um, in the input. So here we have, from this point to this point, you see it goes from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 1, 0. Um, so you can see how the K-map is written such that between two adjacent squares, only a single bit changes. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Um, and you can see we're using the gray code to generate this. So you can see that between any of those two adjacent squares, only a single bit is changing. And this includes, for example, this square here to this square here, um, or that one to that one. Only a single bit is changing between each of those moves. So with the K-map, what we'll do is we'll write in the ones corresponding to each of the locations. Um, so we have here inputs 110 um, is a 1. So you can see 110, for example, is a 1, that point there. And we'll do that for each of the ones in the table. Um, so if I rewrite that table here, again, this is the exact same truth table as before. So you can see these two are correspond to each other. Um, when we have it in this form, the other way we can look at it is that each of these ones corresponds to one of the min terms we showed back here. So, for example, this first one, 0, 1, 1, um, 0, 1, 1 is this point here. And it's also correspondent to the min term A complement and B and C. Um, in a similar way, each of these corresponds to some min term. This one is A and B and C. This one is... A and B complement and C. This one is A and B complement and C complement. And this one is A and B and C complement. Um, so the advantage of this K-map method of write them out is that, as I had said before, between each two locations, only a single thing is changing. Um, so if we look at, for example, this group of four here, what you can see is that between this group of four, between these two top ones, what changes is the B becomes B complement here. Um, and between this, these two here, you can see what's changing is C. C goes from zero to C1. So looking at the min terms, you can see that this bottom group has C, the top group has C complement. If we look at that whole group, um, you can actually simplify it because this whole group can be represented just by, um, what is it here, just by A. So you can see for each of, each of this whole, these, this whole group of four, um, if we just have the input A, it'll actually create that entire group. Um, so we have the input A, because A is always one for each of these, this group of four. And it doesn't matter what B and C is. As long as A is one, the output is one. We can see from this K-map. Um, if 
I create another group here, say over here, we can see that that group of two um, from the K-map, well, C is always one, and you can also see that B is always one, because in both of those, B is one and C is one. Um, it doesn't matter what A is. Both in the case when A is zero and the case when A is one have this, this output one here. Um, so what we'll actually do, erase all, is we'll actually group terms of one, um, and we'll group them, we'll create groups of one, two, four, and eight. So one, two, four, eight, or any power of two. So you could have 16, 32, potentially, if it's a very, very large K-map. Um, and you can say this group is just representing A, and we'll take, for example, this group of two here, um, is representing B and C. Um, yeah, B and C. And so this entire function can now be just written as F equals A plus B and C. Um, if you remember back when I showed the simplification through algebra, this is the act, this is the same equation I showed before, but you had to do a whole bunch of algebra to get to this. With the K map, all I've done is I've written down the ones, I've circled them, and then you're done. So it's quite a bit uh, easier method of getting simplified logic. So we'll use this a lot in the course and on the exam, obviously, because a lot of stuff depends on using the K-map. Um, so when we have it, uh, when we write those ones down, as I said before, each location corresponds to a different mincher. Um, so with the three inputs, these are the various min terms we're talking about. So um, if I write, for example, the one, 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 um, each of those ones is corresponding to a different min term. So when you make a group, for example, of these ones, um, you can see how that entire group can just be replaced by A. Uh, we don't need any of that. Because if you just have A, you'll have that one in that whole location. Um, in a similar way, you can see how this group, let's use blue here, um, this group of two ones can be represented by just B and C. Um, because as long as B is one and C is one, you get that one. Because both of these terms, you can sort of see here it's A complement, here it's A. Um, so they can be, the A can be ignored because you're covering both options, A complement and A within that group. We can do four inputs as well as two inputs. Um, with the four input, this is what the K-map looks like. So we just have two along the top uh, two along the bottom. And again, I'm showing you all of the different min terms here. Um, when we map connections, I had said before that even around the top and bottom, um, they only differ by one. So looking at this group, to go from here, for example, if you had a one there and a one there, um, you can see this term here varies only by C becomes C complement. Um, so if you have ones on the edges, you can consider that they wrap around. This term, uh, for reference, you can, because C is what is varied, if you had this term of just two, it would be A complement and B and D complement. Um, so that's how we wrap around with the K-map. In the same way, it wraps around the edges here. So if we had one here, one here, you could see it wraps around like that. Um, again, this term, because you can see what is varied, is it goes from A to A complement, because A is one here, A is zero here. Um, so this term, A, would not be in it. And you just take the common part of it, B e and C and D. So when we create those groups, you effectively create the group, and you look at what is the common part. The common part is then the term, is that entire term. Um, so the common part here is B complement and C and D. The common part for this one is B and, uh, no, A complement and B and D because C varies. Um, 
If you have something like this, for example, you always want to make the biggest groups possible because the biggest groups will mean the most simple logic. Um, so, for example, if I erase all this thing, um, if you had, you know, to take a simple example, if we have this, if you made two separate groups of two, um, each of these groups, the common part, you basically only eliminate one term for this. So the common part between here, you can see D and D complement vary. So this is A complement and B and C complement. And this one would be A and B and C complement. So your total function, if you did it this way, would be F is equal to the sum of those two because it's sum of product form. Um, by comparison, if I do the same thing, one, 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 but what I do is I take all four of these, um, what you see is the common part now becomes A vary, so it's not that, B, and it with C complement. Um, so now our function is even simpler. The whole function is just F equals B and C complement. So that's why you always want to take as many terms as possible. Um, and again, when you ha if you have something like this, you would try to take two there, and you could do four, so four there, and four there. Um, and you'd have two groups of four. Remember, it has to be groups of one, two, four, eight, sixteen, etc. Um, you cannot have odd numbers in it, so you can't do three. That's totally invalid. And that would be the result of that. If you have four corners like this, um, what you can do is that you can actually make a group of four like that because this here is connecting around to here um, and that connects around to this, etc. So you end up with this group of four. And then these wrap around this way. Um, so if you have four corners, you do have a group of four. You have to be careful because um, the individual corners themselves, so if you have this and this, you can't go on diagonal. So this is invalid. So these are bad. Wrong. Um, that's wrong because you can't actually go on the diagonal. You can only go around that way. You also obviously can't go on diagonals at all, so something like that is wrong. And as I said before, you need groups of four, or well, one, two, four, eight. So um, you can't do something like if you have this, you can't make a group of three. That's totally invalid. What you would have to do in a situation like that is um, two groups of two, and that's the best you can do. Again, you want them to be as big as possible while still respecting the power of two. So all of the rules are written down here. Um, again, the groups 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Left and right connect, top and bottom connect. Always try to maximize the number of terms per group. Um, it's potential that you'll have more than one solution to the exact same problem. Um, for example, there may be a choice of how do you make a group of four? Do you make a group of four here, here, here? Um, so it's it's okay if your answers differ if you're looking through, as long as you sort of say, okay, this is where they differ, and that's okay. Um, and we can also, let's see if there's an example here. We can also use the sum of products um, representation. I showed everything with product of sum here. Um, so with product of sum, what we're doing is we're putting sum of products, or we're putting all the ones down. With product of sums, we'll put the zeros down. So I'll show an example of that. Um, so this will be so with product of sums, we're using uh, max terms instead of min terms. I don't think I actually have a. Okay, here's an example. Um, with products of sum, we're using 
max terms, not min terms. This means we're actually mapping the zeros, not the ones. Um, where we might use this is this example here. There is only two zeros. Um, so to use it with sum of products, let's see, what's this? Um, no, I don't have this. I don't have the same one in uh, sum of products. With sum of products, what you'd have to do is you'd have to put all those ones down and then make a whole number of groups. Um, with product of sum, yeah, sorry, I always want to make sure I say it the right way. Um, with product of sum, what this means is that we're going to just map the zeros. Um, so let's take a look at that. So, for example, in this this truth table here, there's more um, there's more ones than zeros. So when we map the zeros, what this means is we'll just put a zero here, zero zero zero, um, and we'll put a zero here, one zero zero, um, and then the equation just becomes this group here of two. Um, so this is sum of products. No, product of sum. Notation. Um, so what you can see is that this group um, would be, again, with product of sum, we're trying to make a zero. Remember that, so you're putting the zero here. So this, this exact point would just be um, a complement plus B plus C because when A complement when A is 1, A complement becomes 0 plus B which is 0 plus C which is 0, we get a 0. This point here um, would be A plus B plus C. Um, so the end result that you'll get out, the common part here is B plus C, you can see. So then F is equal to B plus C. Um, so that's using the product of sum notation, uh, which is here. So if you if you want to see you get the same result um, using sum of products, I'll do it on this slide. If we put all the ones down, so the ones are everywhere else, you'd have something like that. Um, and what you'd end up with is basically a group here of four and a group here of four. Um, you can see this group, the common part will be B being one, and this group, the common part is C is one. So B and C are those two groups, and you can say the function is equal to B plus C, um, which is the same. You would get the same results using product of sum and sum of products. Um, we'll use product of sums if you have a lot more ones than zeros. So in this case, there's only you know the two zeros. Especially for example, if you have um, larger k maps, that could make a difference. Here, it's not a huge difference, but in other ones, it can't. Um, you may see don't cares in the output. So for example, you'll be given a truth table, especially in the state machines and whatnot. Um, you'll have something like this. So you'll have a whole bunch of don't cares or a few don't cares. And when you do the mapping, um, the don't cares can be zeros or ones. So you have a few options for how you write this down. Um, one way you can do it is you can write the ones and the question marks because the question marks could be ones. Um, so for example, zero, one, one is a one. Um, zero, one, zero, one is a one. One, one, zero is a one. Um, and then 111 could be a 1, it's a don't care, and 010 is a don't care. So based on the don't cares, um, you can say, well, if I make those don't cares a 1, I can make a group of 4, and here I can make a group of 2. Um, otherwise, you would just have 3 individual 1s, so then this whole thing becomes a complement or this, this, just this part would be A complement and B and C complement, 
just this part would be A and B and C complement. Just this part would be A complement and B and C. And just this part would be A and B and C. So I've showed you what the value of each of those ones would be now, now that I've made these ones. Um, and you can see the common part is just the B. So this whole group becomes B. Um, in a similar way, this whole group, because just this is A and B complement and C, um, the common part here is A and C. So this whole group becomes A and C. So it looks a little messy, but you get F equals B plus A and C. Um, so that's how we would use don't cares. An alternative notation uh, that you might find easier when you're given a problem like this, you can actually just write, if you have a lot of don't cares, um, or what you might be given, especially with the state machines, you'll be given an incomplete truth table. So the truth table will only have, you know, if there's three input variables, there should be eight entries, but maybe there's only five entries. Um, if you write down all of the zeros and one, anything that's missing is can become a don't care. Um, so you know, if you write down zero 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 is zero, zero zero one is zero, zero one one is one, uh, one zero zero is zero, one zero one is one, one one zero is one. Um, so I have some blank entries here, and those blank entries are the don't care. So from this, you can see, well, I can do that, um, and I can do that. When you make a don't care one state, obviously it then has to become a one. So if I'm making a group with this don't care here, um, I'm saying it's a one. I can't later use it as a zero. So just be careful you're not... Um, trying anything like that. So we already went through that. We can extend kmaps to higher input variables, like five, five input variables. Um, we will not, we haven't done anything like that. There won't be anything involving five input variables on the exam or um, in any other part of this course. So. It's more shown out of interest. Um, with five input variables, you have to almost make two. Well, you have to make two four input K maps. One where the, the fifth variable is zero, one where the fifth variable is one. You can then have mapping in three dimensions. So if you have a one here and a one here, you can make a group of two um, in the same way because this maps onto that one. Um, with cases like this, it can become very beneficial to switch between product of sum or sum of product um, because, for example, if you have only a few zeros, in a case like this, there's even more um, groups you have to look at in three dimensions. So for checking your results, um, if you want to get some more practice, you can use their software that will give you sum of products or product of sum results and sort of show you how it's mapping it. So that's the sort of summary of the whole k-mapping section. Again, the k-mapping um, is quite an important tool that we'll be using. Another way to use k-mapping beyond just straight input variables is you might be given equations. You might be given something like that and say, use k-mapping to simplify this. So this is before we'd be using algebra. This example equation um, is quite straightforward. You can see I've, been, I've given you a sum of products notation. Um, so we have ABC is basically there's a one here. ABC complement, there's one here. AB complement, C complement, there's one here. Um, so we can see that it's quite straightforward to do, and then you can just make your groups. Um, and you can see that, for instance, this group becomes, is that right? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I over, I drew over all the lines, so. 
you can't really see, there you go. Um, so there's a group there and a group there. This top group becomes A and C complement, and this bottom becomes A and B. Um, and that's your simplified function. It's just F equals that, which is equal to A and C complement plus A and B. Um, again, you can do this for slightly more complicated ones where what you're given might already have some level of simplification. So here it's not directly obvious where the ones go because we have this, this term, which you can map easily. So we have A and B and C and D complement. Um, so A and B and C and D complement. There's one there. The next term, though, has no D in it. It's just A and B and C. Um, so what this implies is that this itself is almost, or is a group. So we have A and B complement and C um, here and here. One D is zero, one D is one, so D and D complement. And um, what this is basically saying is just that there's a one in both of these locations. In a similar way, B complement and C is just saying there's a one everywhere. There's a B complement and C, which is those locations there. Um, once you have this, you can then simplify if possible. So in this example, there's a group of four here. This does not get simplified at all because this is the B complement and C complement group. Um, there's a group of four here. Again, this isn't really getting simplified at all because this is the same. Um, what do we have here? A and B complement, I guess. Simplified a little bit. Um, and then we have a group of two here, so that gets simplified a tiny bit because we previously had this term uh, with four. We had four input variables in it. And this will reduce slightly to A and C and D complement. Um, so that's how we would use an input where just a function to sort of map it a little and simplify it. You may have to convert from another function format to that. So for example, um, you may need to expand the function a little. Typically, it's very, very simple stuff, like you might be given if you're given a um, form like this, so if we have product of sum, um, you may need to break that out to get it into a product, sum of product form. Yeah, so product of sum to sum of product. Um, again, just fairly straightforward. There wouldn't be anything that crazy. Um, and I believe, so this part is talking about NAND and NOR conversions. So where this comes in is it's sort of a little bit extra material not related to the K-maps. Um, when we build circuits, sometimes it's convenient to have everything as one type of gate, either a NAND gate or a NOR gate. We use NAND and NOR gates because um, based on one simple form, we can generate any of the other gates needed. They also physically are fairly simple. So again, these are the diagrams that I showed yesterday um, showing the transistor design of a NAND and of a NOR gate, respectively. And we can see there's only four transistors in them. Um, so it's, fair, it's very straightforward. To generate more complicated gates, like a, even to generate an OR gate, we actually add an inverter on the end. Um, same notation. So we invert the output of the NOR gate to get an OR gate. Um, so as we add more gates, this slows down and causes more power draw. Um, so having it all in NOR gates is actually sort of the simplest representation rather than trying to make an OR gate and then a NOT gate, because we've already added this inverter anyway. To do the conversion, we use some equivalencies. These are just basically De Morgan's theorem rewritten. Um, and it shows you, for example, if you have a OR gate, you can create, directly convert it to a NAND gate with the inputs inverted. Again, remember the, the circle. 
means input is inverted. Um, if we have a NAND gate, we can convert it to an OR gate with the inputs inverted. If we have a AND gate, you can convert it to a NOR gate with the inputs inverted. And if you have a NOR gate, you can convert it to an AND gate with the inputs inverted. Um, so these are showing you possible equivalencies. To do the conversion, so the first example I'll show you is to do a NAND conversion, so converting to NAND. Um, we draw the complete schematic like this. And then you convert first all AND gates to NAND gates. So to do this, all you really need to do is you draw a circle there. So this is now a NAND gate, easy enough. Um, but of course, you've inverted the output, so we have to add another inverter on the input here. Um, so we use that circle to say it's been inverted. Um, next, we convert all OR gates to NAND gates, so we then use that equivalency or given again. When we convert an OR gate, um, that table at the front said if you had an OR gate, it becomes a NAND gate like this with both inputs inverted. Um, so you just stack those inversion dots, logic dots. When you have the two inverters in series, shown by the two logic dots stacked, um, they cancel, as we know, so the end result you get is just this. So there's no inversion. Um, this input was additionally inverted, so we need to get rid of that. Um, because we're asked to do purely with NAND gates. And if you're doing it purely with NAND gates, you can actually create inverters out of NAND gates if required. So that's what I've shown here. We've moved this logic dot to an inverter. Um, you can do the same thing to convert NOR gates to NOR gates if you need to. Um, obviously, this step you start with convert, converting the OR gates to NOR gates, and then you convert uh, AND gates to NOR gates as well. Um, and these are all, all of the equivalencies you might need for that. And I believe that's on the cheat sheet too. So, next thing. So the next thing we're talking about is the time response of circuits. Um, so when we were talking about gates yesterday, when we showed them, we had this super simplified diagram that said, okay, for the not gate, the output is the opposite of the input. So the input is zero, the input is zero, the output is one. When the input goes to one, the output goes to zero. In reality, this is not the case. This is not so straightforward. Um, there's a bit of a time delay here. So here the input, when it goes to one, it's going to take a little time before the output actually goes to zero. Um, so there is a propagation delay of data moving through this gate. It's always specified in data sheets. This gives you some example of what you might see. Um, so for example, we have, if the input's going from low to high, there's this propagation delay for the output to go from high to low, HL. Um, similarly, if the output is going from low to high, there's again another delay. They'll be similar, a tiny bit different typically, if it's going low to high or high to low. Um, but again, we say, see this delay between the input changing and the output changing. Uh, and it varies depending on the logic. As I said before, different logic families. One thing that, um, that or the sort of the major things that differentiate them are speed and power consumption. Um, so here's the same gate we were using in that very first lab, a NAND gate. Um, and we can see 74F, so F is one family, 74HC, this is another type, 74LS. Um, 
We can say for the F, for example, it's saying the propagation delay, and we have low, high, or high, low. Um, typically, it's around three to four nanoseconds. Um, one thing to notice as well is that it also does vary over temperature. So this is at 25 degrees Celsius. Um, in the range of minus 40 to 85 Celsius, it could go as high as maybe 6.5 nanoseconds. Um, so it's not a very, it's not a stable characteristic that you can say with perfect accuracy. It's always, you know, 3.7 nanoseconds, and I can design for that. Um, other families, it might be worse. So this HC series, uh, it's saying typically it's around 7 nanoseconds, so the typical is already higher. But if we're at a lower voltage, so 2 volts instead of 5, it could go up to, you know, 135 nanoseconds for a wide range of temperatures, maybe. And again, the LS, just another um, logic family, we see different typical characteristics altogether. So this is at 5 volts and ambient temperature. Um, so that gives you some idea of what real gate delays are. Um, we can use them, we can make use of gate delays for actual purposes. One of them, uses of them is a pulse shaker, shown here. So what we have is this point here will just be a complement according to your logic. Um, and this point here will just be A. And the output Y is equal to A complement and A, um, which we had known from our uh, identities that it would just be zero. That's useless. What's the point of this? And the point of this is that because of the delay here, um, this isn't exactly the case. So if the A input starts at zero, for example, we'll have zero here. Um, zero here, one here, zero here, one here. So zero and one and it is zero. This is what we'd expect. But if you set this, and I'll use different colors here to show. So if now it goes to one, the input goes to one here, um, what's going to happen right away is that that one will propagate down the wire and basically immediately go here. But the top chain, it actually takes time for that one to go through. So one propagates here, um, but the value, the old value is still there because, you know, right away it's not propagating through. So the output here is actually one. We have one and one, and the output goes to one. Um, in a similar way, you know, after another few seconds, or not seconds, but some more nanoseconds, this will finally go to zero. Um, so now we have the input still one, it's one here, it's zero here, but now the next gate, it hasn't propagated through yet. So the output's still zero, still one. Um, so what you'll see at the final output is that it starts at zero, it goes to one, um, and it'll go to one for, say, three of these propagation delays. Because what's going to happen now is the next time instance, one, one, this will finally propagate through here, and maybe it's, it still hasn't changed at the output of this final inverter gate, it's still one, um, until maybe another time instant passes. And if I use the screen, um, this change value will finally propagate through to the output. And then now this becomes the inverted, and the output goes to zero, because we have zero on the top branch, one on the bottom branch. Um, so it goes something like that. So even though the input just went high, like this, um, so at A, the input just went high. Because it took time for each of those gates to propagate through, um, we get a uniform width pulse. So, you know, maybe if you just turn on one switch, you can just generate one pulse from that. And, you know, if in logic circuits you need some uniform width or shorter width pulse, you can use a circuit like this to always ensure you're generating a specific width of pulse. Um, another use that we have for them is what we call this ring oscillator circuit. So all I've done is connected a chain of inverters together. Um, and again, it seems like this is 
crazy. This wouldn't do anything. It's almost would short out because the output D here should be the opposite of A. Um, there's three inverters in a row, so that point should be the opposite of A. But what we actually get out is we'll get this um, time varying wave. So you imagine if you had a one here, um, you know, it just has to be some value. A one here, and then some time instance later, zero, one, zero. Um, so we'll assume there's that initial value one. This zero goes here and it now becomes a zero at the input. But what's going to happen is, again, it'll take some time for it to propagate through. Um, because right away, this is still going to be zero, one, zero. Um, and the output's going to be zero again. After some time instance, it'll then become correct, so it'll become zero, one. But this one, again, still won't have propagated through because the input to that second inverter has only just changed now. Um, and the instance it's changed, the output isn't updated. There's this few nanosecond delay. So the output's still zero. Um, and if we go through this a whole bunch of times, so then we have zero, one, zero. And again, this just updates, but the output there won't change. And if we go finally some other color. Um, finally, the out this final output here will become 1, and this 1 will feed back. But the whole chain is going to repeat, sort of ignore the... Um, and this 1 will go here, but all of the other ones will still be old, the old values. So 1, 0, 1. Um, and what you'll get at the output is this string of zeros followed by 1s, followed by zeros, followed by 1s. Um, so what it looks like in time is something like this. Uh, so the final output, you'll get this oscillating waveform. So you'll get low, high, low, high. And this has, again, it depends on the stability of the gate delay, um, but it can give you an oscillator with sort of a fairly well-known um, time delay and period, yeah. So this gives you a well-known frequency that you can use to clock some other circuit. So that's one use of gate delays in logic circuits. Unfortunately, gate delays also give us problems. They're not purely a force for good. Um, and these problems come about in what's known as glitches. So if I have several, you know, several inputs to this circuit. Um, I don't show it here. But what might happen is that, you know, if I have this as zero here, as zero here, um, zero there, and say this is a one input here, or actually say this is a one, not a zero. Um, and yeah, okay, that doesn't matter. Um, if this is a 1, so we have a 1 here, and if this is initially a 0, um, actually one second, I'm going to make both of these 1s. So we have a 1 here, a 1 there. Um, if this circuit is initially 0, what you expect to see is this 0 is going here, um, zero there, and we have a one here. So this output is one. So the final output of the OR gate will be one. If we take that one, uh, that zero, and set it to one, um, so this now becomes a one, this will immediately update here, and this will go to one. Um, sometime later, and this one goes here. But this, this right there won't immediately change. So this um, this one, you can see it's 1,1. One, one. Um, it hasn't updated the output yet. So it takes a little bit of time, and then that goes to zero. Um, once this goes to zero, this goes to zero. 
But the output still won, so that's fine. That's what we expect. <coughs> but what happens now if we take that one and we put it back to zero? Um, so what happens is that, again, the zero immediately updates here. So we have one and zero. Um, this output will go to zero after, you know, a few nanoseconds. Um, this is going to zero. And what we expect to happen is that the, the other gate, in a similar time, um, the output goes to one, and that's fine, and the final output is one. But what actually will happen oh, shoot, um, is when this is, this is one, uh, so when this is going from 1 to 0, again, this goes to 0, the output here is 0. Um, what actually happens is this was previously 1, so this was previously 0. This now goes to 0, but for some brief time instance, this is how the circuit looks. There's this gate delay here, meaning this output is still 0, and this is still 0. Um, so the final output of the circuit, which was initially 1, right now will fall to zero um, because both of these are zero. It'll take a little bit of time for this not gate to propagate um, that input change to create a one here and then this goes to one at which point the output goes high. So there's this very very brief glitch where the circuit changes. It shouldn't have. It should It should always create a 1, this circuit output. When A and B are 1, um, it shouldn't matter what B is according to our you know, Boolean logic. But in reality, when you change B, you get this potential glitch. So that's bad. Um, if circuits have that potential for a glitch, not necessarily saying they you know, will always create it, it might just be under certain conditions, but they have a hazard in them because there's some input combination that could have a glitch occur. So there's three types of hazards. Static one hazard is what I showed before. In a static one hazard, it starts at one. Um, it should end at one. So we intend to go from one to one, but it glitches to zero. Static zero hazard starts at zero. We change a single input. Um, and it should stay at zero, but it glitches up. In a dynamic hazard, it, the, the output is supposed to change. It's supposed to go from zero to one, but it changes a few times in between that. So it goes to one, then to zero, then to one. Um, it's important to remember we're talking about a single bit change. If you have multiple inputs, you know, if we had that A, B, C, um, we're talking about, you know, just B changing from 0 to 1 creates this glitch. If both A and B and C all change at once, there's, um, obviously they can't change at precisely the same instant. At some level, there's going to be delay between them, and that will also create glitches on the output. But we're not talking about that because that's sort of a known problem. You can't blame the circuit for that. Um, what we're talking about is a single bit or single variable changes from one state to another state. Just a single change in a single variable. And you have this dynamic or this glitch occurring. Um, so how we analyze hazards and fix them is the this function at the top is that circuit, so I've taken the circuit, drawn it in a function form. Um, if we have A and B plus B complement and C, so we have the inverter on B. Um, so all you do is you simply draw out this in the, um, as written in the K map. So the K map is saying A and B, so A and B um, is this group here, and again, we write the terms exactly as they are and B complement and C. So B complement and C is here. And you can put the ones down if you want. Um, so how we find these hazards is the hazards occur when you notice we have these groups that are adjacent um, here and here. 
So what's actually happening in the circuit is that when the input switches from A, B, C all being 1, so 1, 1, 1, to A, B complement C, so B goes to 0, um, or we go from B of 0 to B of 1 when A and C are both 1, we actually switch uh, what product term is generating that 1. So we can see in the function form, in the first part, we're generating the 1 based on A and B. In the second one here, we're generating this 1 in the output based on B complement and C. Um, when you switch between two adjacent product terms, that and by adjacent, we mean that in both cases it's generating a 1, so both of those groups are generating a 1. It's not supposed to go to 0 in between them. Um, when we switch, it might glitch, so it has a hazard, because there's two adjacent product terms, and nothing covers both of those. Um, how we fix them is we simply add additional logic. So we add logic that says... In both of these states, um, when we switch, we're now inside this product term. So when we go from when we go from A B C to A B complement C, it's no longer changing product terms. It's all within one product term. Um, so to fix them, we actually have to add this additional logic. Um, and in this case, this additional logic is A and C. Um, so all it's saying is that we actually physically add this extra AND gate. Um, and now it's, it no longer matters that B is changing because there's this additional logic that's covering the case. Um, in a two-level network, so I described that yesterday, but basically something like this, we would call a two-level network. Um, the if you synthesize it in this sum of products form, again, the sum of products is meaning something like this. So we have A and B plus or or with B complement and C or with some other term. Um, removal of those static one hazards means there should be no other hazards. I should say static. Um, so static zero hazards and dynamic hazards are also removed. So the dynamic zero hazards occur when we switch in the same way from, you know, a zero, um, if we were to draw this with zeros instead of ones, create the terms, and see if we switch between groups of zeros. Um, multi-level hazards occur um, in a multi-level circuit. So, for example, if you have something like this, I don't know. So multi-level, meaning more than two levels of logic. So here you can see we have, um, at this point, A and B. Um, we use that intermediate to generate this output here, and then we use that second intermediate to generate a third level of logic. Um, multi-level hazards can become dynamic because what can happen is that we'll have one delay. So, if, you know, say input zero chain D changes from zero to one. Um, it'll immediately update here, but there'll be some delay before it updates that intermediate term. Um, and you may have additional levels of delay, and this is where we start to generate that a few gates um, could generate these dynamic hazards where you have more than one change. So, or, you know, it might be as was shown before, something like that. And this occurs because uh, we have one, one gate delay. It's taking a little bit of time, generates that first glitch. Um, but there's a second level of a gate. So, for example, it's delayed going through here and then updates. It's also delayed going through this gate and then delayed going through this gate before finally reaching the output here. Um, and where you'd have this multi-level hazard is, say, if I had C 
directly connecting because now there's three times. Um, if C changes or B changes, you know, it's going to first update um, first update once immediately through the wire. That should connect to B, not C. So it, it's then going to be delayed through a single gate before updating and finally be delayed through two gates before updating. So this is where you get the dynamic hazards. Um, so if you have a multi-level circuit, all you do is you just get a two-level form of it. Um, and then you use a K-map to derive the hazard-free form. When you're simplifying it, be careful not to use the complement laws. Basically, just use distributive laws, typically. Um, the complement laws are how we end up with hazards in the first place. So what I had shown back here, for example, is showing how the inverters are actually adding um, some delay into the circuit that purely by the laws doesn't matter. Um, so we had an example here. We'll start with that top one. Again, this is multi-level because you can see we generate um, one level here, a second level here, and then we have a third level in the whole thing. Um, so to create a hazard-free form of it. Um, all we do is we expand everything. Again, we keep these. We don't simplify the fact that we have A and A complement. Um, you're given this equation. Oh, and I don't actually have it on the slides, but for example, you'd have A and B and C. Um, so something like that, A, B. A and A complement, which we weren't showing there. A and C complement. So where would this be? A and C complement. Um, D and A. And again, you can go through the whole thing. Um, once you get that, you just, as before, simplify it. So we have D and A. And actually, I'll show this to show you where some other hazards. So D and A. Oops, not that one. DNA complement. Um, there's one there, one there, one there, one there, and D and C complement. So one there, one there, one there. Um, so if you had something like that, you could simplify it. You know, we might have a group of eight. It'd be one simplification. Um, group of four, and then maybe make a group of four here. So there, as this is written, um, you'll notice there is some hazards because we have a hazard um, here. So between these two groups, there's a hazard because they're adjacent, but it changes product terms. Um, likewise, when we go from, or actually when we go from here, around, there is no hazard because we're in the same product term. So it's racking around, but that is the same product term. So there's no hazard there. Um, delete that. So to create this hazard free form, we would have to, for example, we could do something like this. So we could make a group of um, four and we would no longer have that hazard because it's not switching between two. And did I forget one when I did this? No? Okay. Um, so that's one example of how we would eliminate the hazards. Again, there's a few more examples in the assignments, and there is the previous assignments as well in previous years that have all of the solutions. The next thing we talked about was multiplexers and demultiplexer. Um, so a multiplexer is just a way of selecting between a whole bunch of different inputs. So here we have you know, input 1, 2, 3, 4, output 1, 2, 3, 4. 
Um, so this is a multiplexer or mux. We might have something like a two to one mux here, two inputs, one output, um, and depending on the state of this S0 line, select line. Four to one mux, four inputs, one output. Um, now we have two address lines. So for example, you can just consider that it's almost like the binary, the select lines are just a binary addressing. So if it's zero, zero input, it's input zero. You know, if, if we had one zero at the input here, we expect that line to go to the output. Um, you can write down all the equations of the MUX if you want. Um, I won't go through this because it's online in the slides, but basically how you would do this is you consider the inputs S1 um, and S0. So that was, those are the two inputs. And your output Q0, we actually just call a variable I0. Um, we do it this way to avoid needing to um, you know, write an input where I0 is 1 and I0 is 0. So for example, we could say Q0 is equal to um, S1 complement and S0 complement. So when S1 is 0 and S0 is 0, we're then going to end that with I0. Um, because in that case, I0, you know, if I0 is 1, the output is 1. If I0 is 0, the output is 0. Um, and in the same way, you can just go through for each of them. So for, oops, that should be S1. Um, yeah, I did that backwards, sorry. So it would be something like that, is the equations for them. So that's showing you that the output, where we're using I0, I1, I2, and I3, as the, the state of that input. Um, eight to one mux, eight inputs. One output, again, three address lines because we need three binary digits to represent eight different combinations. Um, where MUX become useful for us is we can actually use them as a design block. So previously, you know, I'd give you, there's a truth table, do something to design it. So, you know, do a K map, and do all this work. If you have a MUX, you don't really need to do any work at all, which is nice because we can just assign, and if you're given questions like this, it's important you say, I'm mapping you know, A to S2, B to S1, C to S0. Um, and then when, for example, ABC is 0, 0, 0, S2 becomes 0. So this is, I'm using as S2, S1, S0. S1 is 0, S0 is 0. And all I'm going to do is assign um, the value that I wanted the output because when it's zero zero zero, it's assigning input z zero to the output. Um, so by by just putting the required outputs directly at the mux inputs, I can just synthesize any logic function I want. You don't have to do anything basically. Um, so we can actually even simplify it a little more than. Oh. So don't show. Uh, we can even simplify it a little more if you want. So say here I have a four input variable. So there would normally be 16 inputs to the mux. But I only want to use an eight to one mux because I don't want all this extra complexity. Maybe all I have is an eight to one mux. Um, and how we do this is you sort of use the same idea of you can draw it out in a K map form. So just going to make up some stuff here. And then what I'm going to do is assign the first three variables to the input. So S2, S1, and S0 are going to be assigned A, B, and C. Um, I have a, fifth, a fourth input, I have D, that is nowhere to be seen yet. And what we're going to do is that we're going to make groups so that, say, for example, ABC is 0, 0, 0. Um, if ABC is 0, 0, 0, it's going to be selecting input 1. It's going to be selecting input, or input 0, sorry, not input 1. Um, when it's selecting input 0, 
I then have this case that A, B, and C is 0, 0, 0, and I have to select between an output of 1 or an output of 0. And what you can see is that the, the final output for this case only, for the A, B, C of 0, 0, 0, is just the inverse of D. Um, because when D is 0, the output's 1. When D is 1, the output's 0. So all I'm going to do is assign D complement to that value. Um, in the same way, you can move through each possible one. So 0, 0, 1, A, B, C is here. And in this case, it's the same as D. So I'm just going to assign D here. Um, 0, 1, 0. Again, D complement. 0, 1, 1 is also D complement. Um, if it's something like this, where we have Oh, so this is 1, 1, 0, so this is um, binary 6, so this is I6. The output's always just 1, it doesn't matter what the is. Um, same idea here, so 1, 0, 0, which is binary 4, so the output's always 0. Um, 5, 1, 0, 1, the output is D complement, and 1, 1, 1, Again, so the 1, 1, 1 is A, B, C. A, B, C is all 1s. We just look at, based only on D, what happens to the output. So it's just always 0. We don't care. Um, so that's how we typically use a MUX as a design block. Um, and we'll often use this form rather than, with this example, we just tie each input to 1 and 0. Um, with this form, there's a little bit of logic. The advantage of this form is that we can use a smaller box. So if there's eight, if there's three inputs, you only need a four to one box, for example, instead of an eight to one. Um, D multiplexer is the other half of this story, or a D mux. So this would be the D mux. It takes some input and then puts it to one of four possible outputs. We'll give them the same thing, two different names. Um, they'll call, this is what we were talking about, a DMUX, so the exact same idea as the MUX. Um, it selects an input and routes it to one of four possible outputs. Um, with a DMUX, you'll notice we name them differently. So we name, with the DMUX, we name it based on number of input lines or address select lines and number of outputs. Um, so with the mux, it would have been a 4 to 1 mux. With the dmux, it's 2 to 4. I don't know why it's that way, but that's how it is. Um, we also will call something a decoder. With a decoder, we basically just have an enable line, which we tie to 1, so this is enable. Um, the decoder is just picking the inputs are now here. So with the decoder, we have these inputs. Um, and it sets high basically whatever is the output line corresponding to that binary number. Um, so I'll use that example in a second. Um, again, if there's the enable line, we're just tying it high, we have a decoder. If we're actually inputting data that's being routed, that's when we have the DMUX. Um, as a design block, we can also use a decoder. Um, so again, decoder means we have a navel line that we just tie high. And how you do this is that, do I show them? Um, you can think of the fact we have a truth table, you know, like, you have something like that, um, and you say, so that's the ABC, and this is the output. You say, I want one somewhere, so I want these three to be ones. Um, what you have to remember is that what the decoder will do is whatever your input is, it'll just set that one line high. So if I input 0, 1, 1, what it's going to do is the output will become line 3 will be high and the rest will be 0. Um, if I input 0, 1, 0, then line 2 will be high. I can just take those lines that I want high, 
and or them together like that. Now, for example, if I input 101, so if I change this to 101, what's going to happen is Q5 will be high and the rest of them will be low. I don't connect Q5 to anything. Um, so this final output will be zero. It's only when one of the desired one locations is inputted to the bottom, to the input lines of the decoder, the associated output goes high, the final output goes high. Um, so that's how we can use a decoder as a design block as well. If you want, you can think of each of those locations as a min term, which we talked about before. So all we're doing is we're ORing the proper min term up. Um, this is sort of loosely related to the decoder, more or less unrelated actually, but we also brought up this tri-state gate. So up until now we've been talking about we have logic, like this is an inverter. Um, it's in one of two states. It's in the one state or it's in the zero state. So if it's in the one state, internally what's happening is this is wired together. So it just connects it to VCC. Alternatively, if it's in the zero state, um, this gets wired to zero, and it's in this ground state. But what we actually will have is you might also have what they call a tri-state state. And this is we add another gate here. Um, and this gate functions as a switch. If the enable line is high, um, it just direct, it connects the output, so it's either high or low. If the enable line is low, it just disconnects the output completely. And it's in what we call the high impedance or high Z state. In this state, it's basically like you unplug that output completely. Um, this is a symbol for a tri-state buffer, for example, and we'll use the Z uh, notation on the truth table to say, it's in this high impedance, a.k.a. totally disconnected state. Um, so as long as the enable line is low, for example, you can see that the output is just disconnected completely. Um, what this means is that we can actually have another guy driving it. So here's one use for a three-state buffer, a tri-state buffer, um, is say I have a single wire, so one wire, and I have two computers or two you know, electronic circuits and they need to talk to each other over this single wire. Um, if this guy drives the buffer, so the enable line is high, what he's basically doing is connecting this output to the wire. If this guy sets it to low, what he's basically doing is disconnecting his side of the circuit. Um, so now this guy on the left um, he can drive data. So if he's driving the buffer, it can then be read by the other side. So it's transmitted on the wire, um, and the other side can read it. If you didn't have this tri-state buffer, then it, it wouldn't work very well, because if they're both trying to drive it, or if you, know, you have them both at one, the problem you run into is now that, for example, this guy can be sending a one, out the wire, and this guy sending a zero out the wire. So the final data you read will just be totally invalid because you don't know what it is. It depends who is driving the wire harder. One guy's trying to set it to five volts, one guy's trying to set it to zero volts, and it's just going to not be good. Um, so with the tri-state buffer, they can both share one line because they can set it to the high impedance, high Z state, and then choose who is in control of that line. Yeah. Well, the last one you saw, uh, it's high, high. You said um, that it will not work. Yep. It's one, one. Um, you said one sending, uh, one sending one and the other one sending zero. Yeah, so what it is is that if the if the enable line, so this, this, this is the enable line, so th if this is high, um, what this means is that now whatever is here will be, so if this guy has a zero here and that has a one here, um, the data itself can conflict. 
So if this is what this means is if this is zero there, then it doesn't matter. This could be zero or one because the output here won't be driving it. It'll just, it'll be like it's totally disconnected. Um, if both sides were sending one, you know that might not be an issue, but they have no way of knowing what the other guy is going to send, so you can't synchronize it. Um, so that's why you need the tri-state buffer to make sure you physically, it's like you're disconnected entirely from the wire. Yeah, so that's why we have, for example, um, oops, down here, I have this other buffer to read the data in. So the tri-state buffer, it's, it's not really like a switch, because, you know, a switch, you just redo whatever you want. Um, it is a buffer in that this data gets sent to the output. You can't receive anything backwards. Okay, what's next? So, yep. Uh, yep, it would just can't ignore it. In real systems, you may actually. No, no, you, you wouldn't care about rereading it back. You may actually use that to detect a collision because you can read the state of the line. If the state of the line isn't what you're sending, then that's bad because it probably means it's shorted to ground. Um, and you use stuff like that to detect, for example, that the data line, there's some error, like USB can detect that you have, if you short a cable out and stuff like that. Um, so... All right, so we also talked a little bit about programmable logic design. Um, I'll sort of go through this section quicker. I won't go into all the details. What we had showed before is that when we implement a design, you end up with different terms. So, you know, you say, oh, I've got all these ones, and I have two different product terms. So, for example, I have this product term here, which is... What's this? A complement. And this one, which is A and C complement. And then I OR them together. So there's one multiple input AND, or there's one AND gate potentially here, and you OR them. So if we look at the generic way of doing it, we can make this sort of structure for doing anything we want. Um, and this structure for doing anything we want is just you have a multiple input AND gate and you have a bunch of them connected together through one OR gate. Um, this multiple input AND gate, how you have it set up is, as the input, you actually feed every possible, or maybe not every possible, but a number of possible inputs. So here I have A and A complement. Here I have B and B complement. Um, fed into this top term and this bottom term, I have A and a complement, B and B complement. Um, so what you see is that when we had like this previous example, you know, I'm the first term is A that I'm feeding in. Um, so all you would need to do is you would in fact just blow all of these other fuses. So these fuses let us choose what terms get fed into the AND gate. So once this is blown, you see this just becomes A um, and the rest of them go to 1, giving you an A here. For the bottom part, and you actually have, you know, in this case I'm only showing two inputs, so you should have a, because um, I was using C, but, you know, say if you wanted a B complement, or A and B complement, say I was trying to implement that. Um, what you would do is, again, you can blow any of the fuses that are stuff you don't want, They'll just go to 1, and you'll be left with A and B complement. Um, and then your final output would become A and... So this is sort of, in a Selma products form, this would let you implement some design. We call this programmable array logic, PAL. Um, so that simplified diagram I showed on the left, same one as previously. Um, you'll see them represented like this, and this is just an even easier way to look at it. So when you look at this, um, what it's showing is there's one wire here, but this one wire is potentially, you know, in this case, four input connections up to. And you can just say, for example, that 
Um, I'm going to, if I have A and B, I'm going to connect A here, and I blow fuses. So this X's means no connect, um, and I just get this becomes A, and here I'm going to connect A and B complement, and I blow these fuses. Blowing the fuses means you're getting rid of that connection that was there initially. So this is now A and B complement. Um, again, we use this simplified notation where it's just a single wire that looks like it's shorted, but really this means I've done this. Um, and we use this simplified notation because real systems will get more, will get larger than just, you know, four gates. Um, so in real systems, we have several possible um, outputs and several possible ways to combine the product terms. So you can see this is, you know, output one, and this is output two. And each of those outputs has two different options for how you can bind the product term. So as before, maybe I have A and, oops, don't want that. Um, in the top one, you know, this is, output one is still A and A or B complement. Um, but output two maybe is something totally different. So it's, you know, B and A complement. And that's all I want. I actually don't even use the other ones. And then output two becomes, what should I say, A and B. Um, I might have said something different, but this is A and B at the second output. Real systems, this is somewhat more like it might look like a game they get even larger. Um, you can see there's four inputs, so you know we could have the A, B, C, D inputs. It's generating A and A complement, B and B complement, C and C complement, and passing them to each of these possibilities. Um, with programmable array logic, you notice there's that OR gate always has four connections. That's it. You don't get to choose that. You always have four connections there, and that's that's it. So um, you always need to simplify it to a degree that will fit in that device. That's what the physical chip looks like. So you know it's very similar to the 7400 series you used in Lab One, um, and you can imagine with this one chip you can make your life easier because you don't need to wire up a big circuit, or for deploying stuff you don't need large logic circuits. Um, a modified version of that called Programmable Logic Array also lets you choose how these are wired. So you can choose, you know, to wire up three there and two different ones there. Um, programmable Logic Array is slightly more complex than Programmable Array Logic, PAL versus PLA. Um, but PAL were always more popular um, for a few reasons. They were faster and perhaps easier to work with. I don't know exactly why they became more popular. Um, so there's the difference saying, in both of them, you always choose the inputs to the each AND gate. Um, in PAL, the OR inputs are fixed. You have, you know, four OR inputs. In PLA, the OR inputs are fused. Fused means you can change them. So there, that's something you'll never use probably in your life. Um, what you might will start to see and what we've been using in the lab is complex programmable logic devices, CPLDs. In CPLDs, you can think of it as it's a number of those PAL devices um, on one chip with also typically some uh, flip-flops in addition to just the combinational logic. So this starts to give us a little more flexibility. Um, and each, and with CPLDs, it's split into macro cells. So when you were doing the lab, you might have seen, you know, five of 16 macro cells used. Um, all of the macro cells connect together to some switching fabric here. Um, and you can see basically what you have is these are the IO. So this is the input output, the pins on the chip. Um, the pins on the chip connect to the macro cells. Um, and then you can connect the macro cells to each other in some limited degree. It doesn't connect absolutely every line to each other. So there is limits to sort of where you place pins and how that works that will affect your design. Um, 
More complex than that is what we call field programmable gateways, FPGAs. These are the largest devices. Um, with CPLDs, there's a bit of a problem because as you start to try to get more complex, it's basically going to get crazy because we have this central interconnect that's connecting up the different macro cells. You know, if you want to have millions of macro cells, that becomes a bit slower and it becomes just implementation-wise more difficult. FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, uh, take a different tact, and that is that we have blocks of programmable logic drop down. Each of those blocks um, basically can use different technologies. They often look up tables for doing combinational logic and some uh, flip-flops and stuff like that. However, they're not all connected to each other. They're all sort of connected to this programmable interconnect here. And those interconnects are then connected together in a fixed way. So what this means is that you get to choose. So you can say, I want this block to talk, you know, down here to this block, like that. Um, and you, obviously you do have limits, so it, there is software that will try to place stuff in a certain way because there's only so many lines connecting them together. Um, but this architecture is better because if you group related stuff together, they can all talk to each other without affecting the rest of the chip um, because these programmable interconnects can choose just to route data between two blocks directly and not anywhere else. Um, and you can, you know, go across the chip with the programmable interconnects if you want, but in this way it's much more apt to huge devices because you can just keep expanding in dimensions. Um, so, you know, you just keep adding more blocks all across and up and down. Um, and you can get quite large. These type of devices, you can, you know, do development work where you physically design a microcontroller or microprocessor on the device and then you program it with software. Um, so they're used in a huge, huge range of um, sort of industries and research areas. To give you some idea for the timeline of this whole section, um, PLAs, which as I said were where the OR gates are adjustable, became available in about 75. Um, PALs became available in about 1978, the first ones, and that's when they sort of started to get more popular, this whole programmable logic field. Um, programmable logic, it was still at this point uh, a one-time thing. So you programmed it and that was it. It didn't work, chucked out the device. Um, GAL were reprogrammable, which meant for development, you know, you could try something that doesn't work, try something else, try something else. Um, so if you saw anything, you might see GAL devices now, but extremely unlikely. Um, around 1984 and then 1985 were when CPLDs and FPGAs were introduced. Um, they were sort of introduced, they weren't directly feeding off each other because, as I said, they do a different, um, they have a bit of a different architecture. Um, all these three companies, Lattice, Altera, and Xilinx, um, both of them make, or all three of them make both CPLDs and FPGAs, and you can get FPGAs and CPLDs from any three of those vendors, um, and you're likely to run into any three of them in future research projects or in work. Um, as I mentioned, for programmable logic introduction, board you've been using, don't need to go over that as much. Um, that was the specs for the CPLD. As I mentioned, with CPLDs, we have this architecture where you have a number of macro cells that can connect together, that connect to this central interconnect. So this is this, this switch matrix here. Um, each macro cell looks something like that. So we have this, this part, you'll notice, looks extremely similar to PALs. Um, so we have a number of AND gates to create product terms, and then you can combine them together. We have this multiple input OR gate down there. Um, as I said, there's some additional logic, and especially each one gives you this additional flip-flop. Um, so the flip-flop is, you know, how we're doing all the sequential logic and whatnot that, in these devices. Don't need to go over all that. So for programmable logic, 
you can use schematic entry, which is mostly what you've been doing, or various design languages as well. Um, so the final thing I'll go over today is I'll start to introduce sequential logic um, as Friday will sort of be everything nice, finite state machines, um, everything else. So the most basic element of sequential logic is anything that depends on state is what we're calling sequential logic. So not just the current input, but the current input and some um, state information. To do this, we need a way to hold um, data. So we have a reset set, RS latch. Um, with the RS latch, this is the most basic element. If you set it to, let's see, where do I have this? Um, for example, if you set the reset to one um, and set to zero, what you'll get at the output is that you'll see the output here will go to zero and this output will go to one. Um, and you can sort of go through that and say, okay, we'll have a zero here. And why it's a latch is that if you set this reset output to zero, so if we set this to zero, um, what you'll find is that this just stays in the current state because if we have zero and one, um, an OR gate would give us one, nor gives us zero. This zero is still here. Um, so it stays in the same state now that you set the inputs, the inputs to zero, zero. But, you know, if you had set this to one first and then to zero, um, what we would have here is that if we had one here, we'll always get a zero here because no matter if one input to the NOR gate's one, the output's always zero. Zero there, um, zero, zero gives us a one and one there. So now the output Q is one, Q complement zero. If you set this to zero, um, now the output's going to stay at one, not stay at zero. So you can see it depends on the state because depending on the current output of Q, even for the same inputs, the output um, change or is different. So with the input of zero, zero, the output is just holding whatever the previous state was. It's not everything previously we've said, you know, based solely on the inputs, based solely on RNS, you know what the output is. Um, so you can go through, I won't go through this one because that will take a while to show you the various states, but this is what we can write them out as. Um, so this is showing you if we're in state Q, so the current state of Q, what does Q plus become? Um, so for example, this is the hold state where S and R is zero. Uh, we have the reset state where R is one and the set state where S is one. If S and I are both one, I showed before, it's some invalid state, doesn't matter. Um, so in reset, it's always going to zero. In set, it's always going to one. And in hold, it's always staying the same. We'll add additional inputs, um, reset and preset, so clear and set, basically. Um, these reset and preset inputs, you can see we effectively add in to the, uh, by adding a three input NOR gate. So what this is doing is effectively overriding whatever the current state is. Um, we'll also add in this enable input here. So if the enable input is one, you know, if this is one and this is zero, you get one, one, the output's one, one, zero, the output zero. Um, if the enable output zero, it just won't pass anything through. So if you have zero here, zero here, the outputs all go to zero. So when the enable output is zero, it's just gonna hold the current state, um, assuming reset and preset are also zero. We add a data latch, uh, or we, we call this a data latch, when we have this enable line and potentially reset and preset too. A data latch, as long as the output is one, it's forwarding this data to Q. As soon as that goes to zero, um, it stops forwarding, and Q just stays at the same state. So whatever Q is, is now at Q stage, regardless of what happens to D. 
So the final thing we'll cover today is the introduction of what we call the flip-flop. We build a flip-flop from two latches connected together like this. Um, and you can see, for example, say if clock starts at zero, this enable becomes one, this enable becomes zero. I said before, when enable is one, data gets forwarded. So whatever value is at D will now be at Q. Um, but it doesn't go any further because the second flip-flop, the second latch is not enabled. So if we then set this to one, so this then becomes one here and zero here, what you'll see happen is that when this is zero, um, this data here is going to stay the same. So the data at the output of Q will no longer be updated. It just latches into the state that it was. Um, but this data will now be transferred to the output. But because of the first flip-flop being not enabled, that final output data Q isn't going to change because... The, the data from the second latch isn't being sent through anymore. It's just latch in the current state. Um, so this is what we call a flip-flop because what you're seeing is that I have the input here, low, so this is the clock, and then it goes high. So it goes high like this. Um, And the output data is basically whatever data was at the input right here. Um, so, you know, the data could be changing to whatever, um, but it's only at this point when it's transitioning that that output is finally updated because when the clock is low, it goes halfway through. When the clock is high, it's going the full way through. So you can see the clock is low, it goes through the first one. Clock is high, it goes through the second one. So it's on the rising edge, we call it, rising edge of the clock, that the data goes to the final output. Um, so with a flip-flop, we have a schematic symbol that looks like this. Um, so critically, how you know it's a flip-flop is this triangle here, needs edge triggered. Um, the one on the left is rising edge, so rising edge triggered. Oops. This one, because we have the inversion symbol, is falling edge triggered. Um, so on every rising edge of the clock, the data at D will be sent to Q. On the second one here, every falling edge, that is to say when the clock is here, any data at D is sent onward to Q. Um, go through the JK. So you can see that timing. For example, here we have um, clock. There's a, there is a few other considerations around the timing. The data itself needs to be valid sometime before, assuming, say, we're at the, dealing with the rising edge. We have this setup time. So this is the T setup. So you need to set up the data before the clock edge. And why you have this is that you need time for the data to be latched into this first latch. If you change it too soon, if you know it changes right when the clock changes, then it may not actually make it through that into that latch. Um, likewise, once the clock has changed, we have to have the data held the whole time. So this is here. Um, and this is the hold time for the data. So once the clock changes, you need to keep the clock constant for some amount of time. Um, again, you need that because it'll take, you know, right after the clock changes, this flip-flop may still be forwarding data a little bit, especially you see, for example, you have this inverter. Um, so right when the clock changes, it might take a little bit of time before this flip-flop actually latches the data. If you change the data too soon after the clock edge, you could latch invalid data. Um, you'll get into other issues too. And of course, there is some delay between 
when the clock edge occurs and when the output is actually updated. So here it's been made to look extremely severe. It often wouldn't be that bad, but there is some delay between when the clock edge happens and when the final output's updated. So I'll save JK flip-flop conversions and um, state machines for